Good morning. Did you sleep well? I don't really care, but welcome to this much anticipated Q&A about my V10, where I answer all of your questions. However, there is a twist. There will be a mystery question at the end that will explain everything, so you have to watch till the end. Anyway, here is my projector screen where I will show things, and I will answer your questions off my phone. So, question one. Cred2002 would love to hear about the electronic side of things, mostly where I plan on thinning down the amount of modules to a bare minimum and keeping as much of the Toreg as possible. So, mostly I'm keeping all the Toreg electronics. So that'll be the main ECU, this is mostly for an emissions thing. All of the other modules that I'm not using are basically ABS and traction control and everything else will be pretty much kept. There's obviously the things like uh, the rear air conditioning and stuff like that, that can be thrown away, but I'll get to it when I get to it. Interior is coming up soon, so I'm sure I'll go into much more detail then. Uh, how will the transfer case four-wheel drive setup work? Exactly as it did in the Toreg. I'm using the same gearbox, the same transfer case. I'm using all the controllers, the body control modules, everything. So it'll just be turned the same Toreg dial and it'll be in four-wheel drive. Will you be tuning it for more power or leaving it as a stock tune? Are you going to do performance upgrades like turbos, exhaust, intercoolers, bigger injectors, etc.? Uh, the main answer is no, because I plan on driving it on the road. And if you plan on getting certified doing an engine swap like this, you pretty much have to keep all the emissions stuff as standard as you possibly can. And I guess another thing is, it's a ridiculous engine anyway. There's no need for more power on it. I mean, out of the box, it's a heavily detuned engine because the gearbox is the weakest link, which is, uh, I think, limited at about a thousand newton meters. So this engine is 750 out of the box, and I think it's about 350 horsepower, which for a, a diesel, it's pretty insane. I mean, obviously the intercoolers and stuff, as you've seen, they've had to be changed as a necessity, not as a preference. If I could have fitted the stock intercoolers, I would have, but there's simply no space. What made you specifically choose a Volkswagen V10 engine and a Shorty Patrol? Well, you might have noticed that I changed workshops recently. And this is from a conversation that happened in my smaller workshop. And this basically went, wouldn't it be cool to put a V10 into a short wheelbase patrol? And I was like, yep. That was it. Will it need a dragster style wheelie bar? I have no idea. I would imagine it's gonna dog leg like some drag strip thing that you'll see up here. Um, if I do put any power down, so who knows? Who what you gonna do with the bonnet slash hood? It looks to me like it'll be need to cut and lifted. Well, that's actually the main reason why I put a one inch body lift in it. Um, there was a tiny bit of interference between the oil filler cap and the bonnet, and adding an inch to that has unlocked so many possibilities. It's allowed me to run um, coolant and oil lines where I wouldn't have been otherwise able to, and it's also solved that problem. So with any luck, I'll be able to get away with just a stock bonnet, and worst case, I'll have to have some kind of bulge in there, but that's fine. I've already got a pre-designed one that I made for this, which will be easy enough to do. What will you need to do in order to get it registered, and could you please cover that process in detail in a future video? Thank you, cheers. Well, most of it I'll probably cover in a future video. Um, you basically go, need to go through a VSCCS certification process. Um, this is basically saying, hey, I've modified my vehicle. Make sure it's okay. Um, and the general rule is the engine has to be newer than the chassis, you have to keep all the emission stuff in place, and the clearances has to be at minimum 10 millimeters wherever you go. So that, that's a massive generalization. There's a heap of documents. I think there's another question similar to this later on, so I can go into much more detail then. Fantastic channel. Love the humor. Would love to know the engine specs before or after you've finished. It will sound great. So engine specs, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's 750 newton meters and 350 horsepower. And that's not really going to change. I don't think there's any need to. What inspired you to do this badass build? V10 and diesel and twin turbos. And that's about it. And, and that conversation we mentioned earlier. In a completely unrelated to patrol way, curious how MAB guy ended up in Australia. I mean, as a UK guy. I get the draw, it looks awesome, but what was the reason you ended up here? Accidents. So I used to work as a mechanical fitter, building submarines and warships and supercat jackals. Um, and finishing a project, I got a bonus paycheck, which I used to buy a ticket to Australia. 
And uh, while I was there, I sort of happened on a guy who worked at Sydney University. And we got talking and he basically conditionally offered me a place at Sydney Uni. So I was like, okay, um, quit my job over Facebook. And then three weeks later, I was back in Australia starting my studies. And um, five years later to do a four year degree because I wasn't exactly smart and I didn't finish high school. Um, yeah, that was it. So basically fitter, turner, mechanical engineer, and then finally made my way to Australia and love the place. Amazing. I actually got my permanent visa approved at the beginning of my motorbike trip. So yeah, I'm here to stay, unfortunately. What kind of duties do you plan for this little beast? Weekend off-road bashing, overlanding, camping, daily street driver, mall crawler, drifter, wheel standing, funny car. To be honest, I would love it as a daily. Um, I would say that I have more of a connection to this car than I would on a brand new car. So that means that I'm probably gonna absolutely baby it and look after it until I get that first scratch. And then it'll be a free for all, you know? That'll be when I start putting the 35s and not caring about pinstripes all over it. But right now, considering every single nut and bolt on the thing has been touched and done properly and all the paintwork has been done by myself, it's almost like I've kind of gone through the production line of a brand new vehicle and the end result is gonna be this creation. So it's hard to say at this stage. At the moment, I can say it probably won't be doing any difficult stuff. V10 Patrol, tick. Now for a Nissan powered Touareg. Wash your bloody mouth out. Can you please run no sway bars and a big lift with super soft suspension so we can watch you talk wheelie everywhere, please? I would imagine the result of that would just be cartwheels, so probably not. And this one is, how the hell do you have time to do this? Uh, you would be amazed at how little time I put here and there into each video. Um, most of these videos are just stuff that I think is funny that fills up half the video and there's only about real five minutes of stuff that actually gets done. I mean the last one you probably saw me fit a radiator for 10 minutes so go figure. Um, but basically I spend all my weekends and sometimes evenings and things like that making these videos so um, yeah. Now this list of questions is from the more recent Q&A request that I made so maybe there's some repetition going on but you know, just bear with it. How much has it cost so far? Um, I was going to make an entire video about that process but the short answer is nowhere near as much as you would think as long as you're not including labour. How many times have you questioned your sanity or lack of throughout the build? In hindsight would you do this build again? Um, I guess the most sort of anxiety creating thing was when I had a V10 complete and I had a short wheelbase patrol and everything was unknown. So once the, once the patrol was apart, that's fine. That's like four bolts and it's done. And I can always put it back together with a TD42. But if you look at how complicated it was to take out the V10 engine, if that hadn't fitted in the chassis, I would have absolutely hated having to put that all back, to, back together again. So I guess that would be a sanity questioning moment. Um, so in hindsight, would you do this build again? Uh, knowing that it fits, definitely. But obviously I haven't driven it yet, so yet to be decided whether it's a good car or not. What's the weight difference going to be like from whatever motor that patrol came with to what it has now? Also, what motor and box combo did the patrol have and what model GQ is it? So that's from someone who obviously didn't watch the videos. Uh, it's a short wheelbase 1991 Nissan Patrol. It's a GQ, obviously. Um, it came with the uh, TB42 carburetor engine. Just, just watch episode one. Why are you asking this? Now, in terms of weight difference, I think the weight difference between the engines is about 100 kilos, meaning the V10 is about 100 lighter than the TB42. And um, I think the, the Touareg is close to three tons out of the box. And I think the short wheelbase patrol is close to two tons. So I'm basically going to be saving approximately a thousand kilograms when comparing you know, the vehicle and the donor vehicle. Are you still planning on using the air suspension setup from the Touareg? Um, while it would have been extremely cool to have, uh, completely inappropriate to do it. I did kind of have a think about it and I'd be modifying too much to get it to work and then there's all the certification side of things. I just want to keep it straightforward and maybe think about it at a later date, but probably not. Okay, so this is a very long answer to a relatively short question. Does this creation have to pass a government test 
MOT before being taxed and allowed on the road. Dullest question ever. Also, more importantly, what will the horn sound like? So, an MOT, if you don't know, is the equivalent of a very harsh pink slip in New South Wales, which is basically an annual check. But a pink slip, they kind of look at your car and say, it's okay, go on the road. Whereas an MOT, they do everything from an emissions test to a brake check and all of that other stuff. So I guess our equivalent is a blue slip. It's harsher than a blue slip. Yeah. Either way, you get the idea. It's an inspection. Um, what do you have to do before being, it's being taxed on the road? So uh, going back to that VSCCS thing that I mentioned earlier, this is like an engineer examines the vehicle to make sure everything is in spec. Um, there's certain regulations about engines and you're allowed to replace an engine with an engine from a different model of the same car that has a different engine and that wouldn't need certification. But then if you do things like adding turbos then it, where it otherwise wouldn't have had a turbo or brake modifications or diff swaps, things like that, that's when you start needing your certifications and it all racks up. And you're trying to look for that sweet spot between getting a modification certificate and needing a whole custom vehicle thing, which is horrible. That would then mean that your vehicle then has to meet the current emission standards rather than the emissions of the age of the engine that you're transplanting in. So to try and cut it a bit short, um, you basically have to make sure that all the emission stuff is maintained. Um, you have to make sure there's correct clearances on the engine, that you haven't modified the um, forced air induction in any way, or at least in a way that doesn't increase the power by a certain amount, I'm led to believe. Um, th there's all sorts of things. Um, there is no set standard for this VSCCS certification, which means but that by default it's kind of like the Wild West. So it will depend entirely on where you go, because these examiners are the ones who set the standards for their own requirements. Anyway, that was probably nonsense, and it's time for the next question. How is the front and rear balance compared to stock? Uh, won't know until it's either driving or I'm trying to get it certified because part of the certification process is find out your front and rear bias. So I'm guessing it'll be the same as it was except 100 kilos lighter on the front, which means I can add a bull bar and keep soft suspension. Can you please go over engineering considerations? What you spoke about with the engineer? What was he concerned about? What was he happy about? Well, seeing as I'm the engineer, I'm pretty happy with everything. I'm kind of currently going through the VSCCS certification process. So even though it's kind of a conflict of interest if I certify my own vehicle, I'll at least know the standards and procedures. Uh, so basically you have your VSIs and your VSBs and the Australian design rules, and these are freely available online. I mean, you don't really have to talk to an engineer unless there's something that's kind of in a gray area. So as long as you study all of these documents, then everything should be fine. I mean, there's no reason for it to fail as long as it complies with the ADRs. But obviously this all depends on the age of the vehicle. Um, older vehicles uh, would have to comply with the older ADRs and the new vehicles would be the newer ADRs obviously. So mine currently has to comply with the newer version of the ADRs. How are those water to air intercoolers working out? Well to be honest I have no idea because I haven't driven the car with them yet. But I'm guessing um, considering the size of the coolers for them is pretty small uh, they're not going to be as efficient as they should be, and they're going to be less efficient than the intercoolers that I took off the Touareg. So this is one of those things where space has been a compromise, and while it'll be somewhat functional, it's not going to be as good as it was from the factory. I mean, that, that's just a fact of life. Nothing, it's, it is what it is, really. Um, yeah, so they'll be alright, but they won't be great. What was the pinion angle on the engine gearbox transfer case? It looked quite steep in one of the videos where the body was off. I'm doing a similar engine swap and I'm at the stage of mounting the engine. Well, um, so it depends which shot you're looking at. If you're talking about this shot, uh, this would probably be before I actually made the uh, gearbox mount. So that would have been a ridiculous angle there that has definitely been solved. So by default, your engine is usually tipped backwards a little bit. I think it's about six degrees off the top of my head. Um, mine is close to that, I think it's a little bit more. And if you check out your diff angle, if your vehicle's on a hoist, you'll notice that your pinion angle is pointing straight up at the air. So basically the lighter your vehicle is, the more your diff points up. Now I haven't done any exact measurements, I've just stuck my head under and had a look. But from what I can tell so far, the transfer case flange is basically the same angle as the rear differential. So 
The good thing about this is that uh, if I really get to the point where they're not lining up, I can always get um, adjustable arms and put them on the rear diff and then kind of nail that in. The other thing is, if you notice, when I was designing those gearbox mounts, I mentioned something about how I can shim them. So all I'd have to do is CNC cut a few more of those plates, use longer bolts, and then I can move the gearbox up and down as I need to. Been a great series. How much power and torque do you think you'll make at the wheels? Do you consider using the 4.2 litre V8 from a Q7? I understand for a V10 this is a bit underpowered, but I imagine it's got a lot left in it. Uh, the V8, I think, actually has more peak power than the V10 does, but it's not a V10, to put it simply. Uh, how much power and torque do you think it'll make? Um, this is kind of related to diff ratios in a way. Um, I've calculated that basically if I compare the stock Toreg diff ratios and the stock size of the wheels on the Toreg, um, and I'm using 3.9 differentials on the Patrol, um, I calculated that if I use 35 inch tires, my speed sensors and all ratios will be exactly the same as the Toreg. So it, it could be safe to approximate that if I use 35 inch tires on this build, I will have the exact same power figures as the Toreg did out of the box. But as it happens now, I've got 31 inch tires on it, so who knows what's gonna happen. It's probably gonna be upshifting like crazy. Um, probably isn't gonna be any good. So I guess what I'll have to end up doing is maybe get it certified with 35s. And then that brings its own host of problems like getting 35s to fit on a GQ without scrubbing because yeah, to be honest, not a fan. Was a petrol ever considered? Was there a different engine under consideration? Um, well, I didn't really know that the V12 diesel existed, so I would probably would have used that if I'd known about it, but now looking into it, they're about $100,000 worth of car, so that would have been a bit much for this build. So I guess this is the best within the budget that I was willing to spend on this. Will you run the stock ECU tune or get a custom tune? Uh, that, that's a tricky one. Um, depending on what uh, driveline or tyre size I end up using, I could end up needing to get a tune to account for that difference in tyre size. And as far as customs, custom tunes go, um, probably not. The only thing I'd like to do is uh, do things with EGRs, but that's obviously illegal, so I definitely won't do that. Super stoked to see someone else doing this. I own two V10 Toregs and have been planning to swap one into my aluminium, aluminum. Toyota FJ40 build. My only question was standalone OEM ECM, what? Stand, standalone or OEM ECM. Thanks for making my task easier. I don't think I've made it easier. Um, basically you're stuck with the stock ECU because um, PD diesels are extremely difficult to get aftermarket ECUs for. Um, any other diesel type, you know, like uh, direct injection, indirect injection, mechanical fuel pumps and stuff, obviously they don't have an ECU but anything that currently has an ECU except for a PD, you can use aftermarket ECUs, no worries, but PDs are just a whole level of bullshit, so it's not something you want to dive into. The main advantage on the VW ECUs is that they're extremely customizable, and once you kind of jailbreak them, I guess, um, you can pretty much do whatever you want with them, so it's a very good thing to have, um, so it's kind of lucky. As for the FJ40 build, um, I would say just make sure that your chassis rails are far enough apart, and as long as they're fine, then you're all good. Um, I think I, I can't remember which video it is, I'll put it up here somewhere, it was when I was trying to weld in the engine mounts, I went over exactly how much width there is in the chassis rails. Off the top of my head, 645mm, but something around there, if you've got more than that, you're good to go. <laughs> Apart from the obvious, German engineering and power. Why the V10? Why a shorty? If you did it a second time, no budget, would you change anything you've done so far? Will you be throwing any of the Vag upgrade parts from that one? Okay, so why the V10? Um, I am a sucker for exotic things. And if you, if you uh, read the spec that they put up of this engine, it's bloody phenomenal. You've got everything from um, aluminium bores that have been plasma hardened so that they don't wear out, obviously. Uh, to offset gudgeon pins so that there's less piston to cylinder wall contact. Um, the whole engine, like the stressed members are the only steel components of the engine, which in makes it incredibly light for what it is. Um, just loads of things like that. I mean, it's an incredible piece of engineering. I mean, I know people give them a hard time, 
Um, but the main reason for this is because if it's in a Touareg, you've got to drop the engine out for almost anything. But almost all of those issues are solved on this patrol build. Um, so basically, it's almost like this is what Volkswagen should have done to make the perfect engine. But instead, you know, they decided to cram it into a football mum's car. But I guess that brings you on to the question of why a shorty? I just like them. There's a, there's a bit of a cult following going around about these cars and I'm definitely on that bandwagon. I think they're awesome cars. And I was lucky enough to find this one that hadn't been quarter chopped. It was relatively rust free. I mean, you know, I've seen I've had to do a bit of uh, stuff on the windscreen, things like that. But, you know, it's, it's all good to go now. It's resprayed. It's awesome. So it's going to be the perfect car, really. Plus, I want to do wheelies. Hopefully, probably not, maybe. Why isn't there more sanding content? Furry dice or sex wax air freshener hanging from the rear view mirror. Well, I know it's not gonna be the second one because this car isn't gonna smell like feet like every other Nissan Patrol. It's gonna be its own special odor. Odor Patrol. I'd also better go back to that previous question that I just had. Um, if you did it a second time, no budget, would you change anything you've done so far? To be honest, there isn't really a budget. I've just kind of done it as I found things on Marketplace. I mean, I'm not really willing to spend like 20K on a donor vehicle. So obviously I've had to wait until the right price has come up, but it's all worked out really nicely. Like there hasn't really been a set budget. I mean, I've made what I've needed to. I've bought new what I've also needed to. So yeah, there's nothing that um, your average person couldn't afford here. And I wouldn't change that. Now here's a trigger worthy question. Aside from the obvious, because you can, why? Why take an arguably brilliant vehicle and then take the drivetrain and transplant it into, well, a far less than brilliant vehicle? And before you ask, yes, I'm a 7L Touareg owner. Well, the fact of the matter is, a Touareg is, by comparison, a terrible off-road vehicle. I'm, I'm sure it'll tow your caravan up a Mount Everest or something, or, you know, It'll take you down a dirt road or maybe on the beach or something like that. But the fact of the matter is it's it's not an off-road vehicle, really. It's a good platform. It's the similar to the, the Porsche Cayenne. But it's never going to go the same places that a solid axle vehicle is going to go. I mean, it's IFS and IRS. That's, you know, solid front... Uh, sorry. That's independent front and rear. And you'll get this uh, community of uh, people who have these similar sorts of vehicles. I'm not saying Touaregs. I'm saying any kind of less than capable let's say soft roader almost, they'll kind of band together and be like, my car will get anywhere your car can't. And it's, it's cute to think that, but I mean, it's just simply not true. I mean, so the big contenders in the four wheel drive game, uh, the Land Cruiser and the Nissan Patrol, they have kind of a beef with each other because they're arguably the most capable vehicles on the market. And this is true because they're bloody fantastic and they're very modifiable, but you're very limited to what you can do on the other end of the spectrum, apart from just whine about how you can go to the same place as another car can when you physically can't. So that's why you're probably angry right now. When this wonderful monstrosity is on the tracks, please get in touch with four wheel drive 24 seven and pit it against Sooty at a four wheel drive park of their choosing. <laughs> no, thank you. And the last question, which I get asked an incredible amount. Where is my bike? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you close to my face so I can turn this camera around. It's right there, looking lovely. And that's where I'm sleeping for tonight. And that's a weird mountain. I'm in Turkey right now. I just passed through Federal Iraq about two days ago and I'm on my way to Istanbul. So if you give a shit about my bike videos, um, I won't be uploading any more to this channel. I have a motorbike channel, which you can find right there because the YouTube algorithm seems to hate it when you stray away from four wheel drives when you're a four, uh, when you're a four wheel drive channel. So I'll do one more video about it related on this channel, which will go through what happened through my horrible shipping experience. And then everything else after that will be uploaded to the new one. Anyway, that was the Q&A.